information. Uh, we've been talking a lot about different women over this year because I, I feel like I can relate to them a lot and I hope you can too. This episode we are talking about one Olympia Fulvia Morata. She is Italian, if you can't tell. Her name is Olympia Fulvia Morata. It's a very Italian name. Um, and she's a little bit different than the women that we've been discussing so far. She was born in 1526, so about nine years after the 95 Theses were posted. So by far, she's the youngest woman we are talking about. She was the daughter of Fulvio Pellegrino Morato, which, again, so Italian. Who named these people? He was a humanist scholar and a university professor specializing in the classics. He was especially interested in Protestantism, which was then passed on to Olympia. Because he was so smart, I think is 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 almost a an understatement when regarding Fulvio, but um, he was very, very intelligent, and he raised Olympia in that manner as well. By the time she was 12 years old, he, she was fluent in Greek and Latin, um, which, pop off, okay. Um, her father was a scholar in the ducal court. Um, the duke was Catholic, and his wife, I saw this and I almost died laughing. Um, because if you remember last week, I told you about how Marie Dontier was so closely tied to Marguerite de, Nav de, Marguerite de Navarre. Everyone has such vastly different languages. It's very difficult to keep all the pronunciations straight. But anyways, um, I, I told you guys how Marie they were very closely tied. And as it turns out, Olympia also has ties to Marguerite de Navarre, because of course she does. So the Duke, whom Olympia's father worked for, was married to a woman named Renee. Renee was not raised by her parents for reasons that I didn't bother researching because I just wanted to get this episode filmed and out to you guys. Um, but she was raised by her aunt, who was Marguerite de Navarre. Because of course, of course. Um, Renee's daughter, Anna, was um, a companion. Well, really, Olympia was a companion to her. Olympia was also a tutor for her. They were very close. Um, and so that is how Marguerite de Navarre is tied into this one, because she's tied into everything. I really hope she has ties to Katharina von Bora, too because otherwise next week's episode is going to be really boring. It won't be, it's Katharina. Anyways, between the ages of 12 and 14, Olympia was invited to discourse at court uh, in both Greek and Latin um, about the works of Cicero and Homer. Uh, she found this very entertaining. She loved being, they regarded her uh, child prodigy, and they have like a really fancy Italian name that I didn't bother learning how to pronounce. Italian's a very easy thing to pronounce. I just I didn't feel like it. Sorry, guys. Um, so that she she loved being a child prodigy, and we're gonna get into that. Um, well, she she wrote a poem because she loves poetry. Poetry was a very big thing back then. That's why, like, all of these women were poets or writers in some way. That's just kind of how they're like social media influencers, except smarter. Do I count as a social media influencer? I'll have that existential crisis later, but she loved her role as a child prodigy, and she wrote uh, in one of her early Greek poems, And I, though born female, have left feminine things, yarn, shuttle, loom threads, and work baskets. I admire the flowery meadow of the muses, and the pleasant choruses of the twin-peaked Parnassus. Other women perhaps delight in other things. These are my glory. These my delight. Obviously, this was the mid, early to mid 1500s. Women didn't get much. 
So for her to be able to not be in a very heavily feminine role was a big deal for her. So she's not trying to be all like, I'm just not like the other girls. But from a cultural standpoint for that time, this was a very real thing for her. It was very real for her to celebrate that. Um, she was lifelong friends with Lavinia Della Rovere. Again, so Italian. Who, what? Anyways. Um, both of them later eventually advocated for the release of, um, I included this because it's so funny to me, a noble Protestant whose name, and I, I wish I was kidding, I'm not, his name was Fenino Fenini. So, there's that for you. When she was 20, so in 1546, she left court, um, even though she loved court. She left because her father had fallen ill, uh, later died, and when he died, he tried. To, she tried to go back to court, wasn't welcome because Anna had been married off and was now in a completely different country. And she was stuck because she couldn't go back to court, which was her entire livelihood. She couldn't rely on being a child prodigy anymore because she was in her 20s now. And also the, the Duke, thanks to the Roman Inquisition, hated Protestants and he banned his subjects from reading or discussing scripture. So she wouldn't have fit in very well there, to say the least. And so she was kind of stuck because that which she loved was no longer accessible at all. Um, by the end of 1550, people debate whether it was 1549 or 1550, and I don't have the energy to figure it out because I'm not a historian. I'm just making videos. She married Andreas Grundler of Schweinfurt, which is aggressively not an Italian name. So now we're back to the Germans, like all good reformers. I'm kidding. Um, so speaking of the Reformation, what, I mean, she seems like a cool lady, but what, aside from being friends with the daughter of the niece of Marguerite de Navarre, what did she have to do with the Reformation? So mostly she was an author. Um, we, it's kind of difficult because we aren't 100% sure everything she wrote because most of her works were destroyed, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, but she was primarily an author. She, you know, going from popular, famous child prodigy to an exile, basically, was difficult. That was a, that was a switch. She basically had nothing at that point. But she said, I am glad for all that has happened to me, for if I had lingered any longer in that court, it would have been the end for me and my salvation. And because of this shift in her thinking, she started focusing less on philosophical works, like, um, you know, what she had grown up with with her father, and started focusing more on theological. So she spoke with leaders like Calvin and Melanchthon, um, and other people, but those are the cool ones, fought for biblical literacy and the translation of theological works into Italian, um, and she urged Anna to stand up against the persecution of Protestants in France. Catholics, although they meant this as an insult, come up with better insults, come on, like you're Catholic. Uh, she, they called her the Calvinist Amazon. You'll notice most of these people are Calvinists. I get that. Um, we'll be talking about a good Lutheran next week. Love her. Um, Calvinism was a big thing back then. It's still a really big thing today. We can discuss the differences between Calvinism and Lutheranism at a point that is not today. I don't feel like getting into that right now. So she continued writing poetry in Greek and Latin. Like I had read a stanza earlier from her. Um, she wrote some love poems to Andreas, which is really cute. And I love that for her. But her crowning literary achievement, she has two. The biggest one, according to her contemporaries, was her translation of the Psalms into Greek. The Psalms are notoriously difficult to translate because it's poetry. And translating poetry into any language 
is a very difficult task because you have to balance everything that the author was trying to portray with the the language and the cultural you know context around the language for the readers but then also preserving what was originally said and it's it's a very difficult task she basically what she did is she transmuted the parallelism of hebrew poetry um so like the the, the form uh the poetic form that that hebrew usually uses into the um hexameter and sapphic verse of greek poetry which is absolutely brilliant and everybody thought that they were it was incredible um her husband andrea set them to music and this was her crowning achievement because people who you know a lot of the scholars spoke greek and latin better than they spoke their own native tongues and now they could go and sing the psalms with people from all sorts of countries because a lot of the scholars knew greek and they knew latin um that was a very common thing that was taught so everybody can sing it um so that was one of her crowning achievements and the other one which isn't as you know but it's up there was a pair of dialogues in latin which those were dedicated to lavinia um they followed the traditional greco-roman uh, dialogue models which lavinia would have immediately recognized and admired um olympia cast herself as um theophilia or theophila and lavinia mm -hmm. as philotema which the significance of those if you remember I can't remember if this was an at the cross or an in-person Bible study that I did, but I was talking about Luke and uh, the dedication in the beginning to Theophilus. Theophilus is the male version of the name Theophila, um, which just, it literally translates, it's a Greek name, it, it translates to um, lover of God. And then Philotema translates to lover of honor. Um, and one of the quotes from uh, Theophila is, don't be afraid. No odor of sinners can be so foul that its force cannot be broken and weakened by the sweetest odor that flows from the death of Christ, which alone God can perfume. Therefore, seek Christ. Which I think is sweet. So those are her two main achievements as far as um, the writings that have survived. She wrote a number of letters of consolation and encouragement to her fellow scholars and lay women in latin she moved after becoming an exile in court she moved with andreas to schweinfurt which is where he was born that did not last long um we talked last week marie dentier or marguerite I, no it was marguerite and her daughter um about the wars. We don't tend to talk about those very often in, in church history. Um, they're not super fun. The wars between Catholics and Protestants. Um, you think Facebook comment section battles were bad? This was, this was a new level. It really was. So Schweinfurt quickly became a war zone it resulted in a lot of starvation and disease in the area, and it ended up being burned down. So Olympia and Andreas had to escape, and they escaped with only the clothes on their back. Olympia, in fact, had no shoes, and she only had an undershirt that was given to her by another female refugee. Like, they had to dip, which was really rough. Um, most of her writings, this is when most of her writings were lost, because they were burn it down. So the Catholics didn't really care about saving them because it was uh, Protestant. Um, because of all of this, um, her health was irreparably damaged. She then went to Heidelberg with Andreas and he joined the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Heidelberg and she tutored students in Greek and Latin. Um, and it's from there that she continued to write letters. 
Elector Palatine Frederick II, which is a ridiculous name, offered Olympia a position to teach Greek at the university, which, may I remind you, at this point, it is like the 1530s, maybe the 1540s, maybe. She's a woman. So to offer her a position like that is a really big deal. Um, we're not 100% sure if this was a full professorship or if it was just like, I don't know, something else. I don't know the full university structure of the mid-1530s in Germany. I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, she would have been the first woman in history to hold that type of position, which is crazy. Good for her. Unfortunately, she had to turn it down because of her health, and not very long after, just shy of her 29th birthday, she died of tuberculosis. So that's unfortunate. However, the University of Heidelberg did not forget about her. Um, they still, to this day, offer um, a program called the Olympia Murata Program which is a subsidized position offered to female scholarships with PhDs doing research in science, medicine, and other fields, which is really cool. To wrap all of this up, I am going to read you an excerpt from her final poem and um, what one source I found said her final words were. So her final poem said, I long to fade away, so great is my confidence in Christ and to be with him in whom my life thrives. Slay, first of all, incredible. And her final words to Andreas were, I saw in my sleep a place full of the clearest and most beautiful light. I am totally happy. I can barely make you out anymore, but everything else seems to me to be full of the most beautiful flowers. And then she died. So that's unfortunate for her. But Olympia is, fantastic. I mean, she's a brilliant woman. Um, and though we don't know fully the extent of how she helped the Reformation, it is clear based on her conversations with Calvin and with um, Melanchthon and, and a bunch of other reformers, as well as the translation of her psalms, her psalms, the translation of the psalms, her translation of the psalms into Greek um, and everything else. She, she, undeniably contributed a lot to the Reformation, and she's a wonderful person. So that, my friends, is Olympia Fulvia Morata. Next week is a Reformation week. I'm very excited. I love Reformation week. I'm kind of disappointed um, because I was planning on having a full um, Katie Luther costume. Uh, I did not have time to make one. Um, and shockingly enough, Party City does not carry a Katie Luther, unless I wanted to wear like a nun costume and just carry a copy of the 95 Theses or like a barrel. I don't know. We're not going to bother with that though. So next week we will talk about Katie. I will not be in costume. I won't. Um, and I'm very excited. I love Katie. So that is that. And I will see you guys.